Well, you know, this Easter we were to have our guest Shane Willow with us and my we enjoy his ministry every second Easter. He's booked in, you know, for 2022. So isn't that incredible? Every, every positive year, alternative year, he sets aside the Easter weekend just for us. But we can, we'll have him sometime in, in 2021, of course, through the year. But, but here we have, we have one of his, I think, one of his favourite messages. I, I like this. It's up there with the best of them. And it's about uh, the goat has left the building. And enjoy this this morning. He preached this in one of our Sunday Easter services. And so enjoy it today. And just let the Spirit of God touch your heart and life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. I always look forward to coming back here. I, I find that um, I just have a lot of respect and honor for your pastor and his wife when I look at the faithfulness over a long period of time of what they've been used by God to do in this great city, in this country. And um, I encourage you as a part of this church, if you're on the fence, and you're like, well, should I get involved? Should I not? Should I help him? Yes. Get involved. D d look, what else are you going to do? Go home and watch NCIS? It's boring. <laughs> <clears throat> Gibbs gets the bad guy every time. <laughs> when you could be a part of bringing heaven to every place we see hell on earth. I want to talk to you this morning about regrets. How do you handle your regrets? Now, as, as soon as I say that, um, you should perk up because I could preach on topics that are only applicable to certain people. And sometimes as pastors, we have to do that. You have to preach on parenting, which... Uh, doesn't apply to everybody. You have to preach on marriage sometimes, and that doesn't apply to everybody. Um, but when I say, I want to I talk to you this morning about regrets, that applies to every single person. H how do you handle regrets? Now, this is an age-old question. It's, there's been thousands of answers to it. Thank God we don't live in ancient Sumerian culture. In ancient Sumerian culture, if you came to your priest and you said, I've offended the gods and I need to get this thing right, they would hand you a knife. And they would say, start cutting. Well, the, the problem with that is if I say, you can get right with God by cutting, what's your question? How many cuts? And, and the answer was, I, I don't know. Just cut. Cut, cut till you feel right. In some traditions in that culture, they would tell them, cut until it rains. They lived in Iraq, right? <laughs> so, so you have people everywhere not knowing. Because the problem with cutting is, what if you do 10 cuts, but the magic number is 11? And so you, you went to bed at night actually not knowing if your regrets were okay. In, in the dark ages, we went back to this. Some monks wrote in their diaries, I prayed on my knees on stone floors until they bled. Which leads to this question. What concept of God leads you to believe that inflicting that kind of pain on yourself impresses him? What, happen, what happens inside of us? We do the same thing today. We just remove the knife. We, somebody comes to us and says, well, I, I, need, I need to get right with God. And we say, well, get up here to this altar. Okay, what do I do here? You need to be sorry. Which leads to all kinds of questions like, how sorry? And how sorry is sorry enough? And more importantly, how long do I have to stay before God knows that I'm sorry? And then we use more language that has no definition, like just stay till you get your breakthrough. Okay, so you stay till you get your breakthrough until next week you hear someone else telling the story of their breakthrough and their breakthrough sounds better than your breakthrough, which leads to the question of whether or not you actually ever had a breakthrough. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you still go to bed at night wondering, is, that, is God actually okay with me? That this message is for anyone who's ever went to bed at night wondering, I wonder if God still holds this against me. I made this mistake. And I, if, if I could have a do-over, I would take it. I, I'm talking about the things in your life that you pray to God never ends up on Facebook. <laughs> that. I, I'm talking about whatever the mistakes you've made, that when you meet a new group of people, you wrestle in your heart with whether you tell them about it or not because you're wondering if they knew if they would think less of you. That. I, I'm talking about the things in your life that if you could have a mulligan, if you could have a do-over, that you would take it. Nothing in your heart wanted to do 
what you did, but you did it. And if you could have a do-over, you would take it, but you just don't. And everybody looks at you and acts like you meant to do it. But the truth of it is, is that everything in you agonizes over the fact that if you could just have a do-over on this one thing, you would do it. What do you do with that? <clears throat> what do you do with that thing? As I was looking at this, what I found was, is the most ancient answer was the best answer. In the book of Leviticus, God gives this order. He says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have one day a year where we're going to make all things brand new. All sins for the whole year are going to be emptied out. If I could use a bucket as an illustration. Um, um, if you fill up your year's worth of regrets into this bucket. On this day, this day happened on Tishri 10. It's just a month and a day. It's, think September 10th, okay? If, if on September 10th, on Tishri 10, what we're going to do is we're going to, everybody's going to come together and you're going to bring your entire year's worth of regrets. And what we're going to do is we're just going to empty the bucket so that you don't carry this year's regrets into next year. Because the idea was, if you carry this year's regrets into next year, then next year your life is going to get heavier. And then if you do it again, you're going to need three buckets. And then if you do it again, you're going to need to consolidate it into a barrel. And if you do that as a pattern of living, one day you'll need a crane to pick up your life because it'll be so heavy. Which leads me to this question. Do you still feel guilty about anything that's over a year old? Because even in Leviticus, this was not allowed. In, oh, did I make that clear? This was true in Leviticus. A later writer said that God's mercy is actually new every morning. Jesus said, if you want to know what I'm really like, I forgive 70 times 7 for the same sin in the same day. How is it that a church that beats the drum, we're under grace, not under law. We're under grace, not under law. We're under grace, not under law. How is it that that church became meaner than Leviticus? In Leviticus, you could not hold people's sins against them past one year. If someone fails in today's church, how long will the church hold it against them? As long as Google will hold it. <laughs> it just keeps coming back up. So how is it that a church under grace is actually meaner in its practice than the church in Leviticus? In Leviticus, which by the way, Karen Armstrong, who's a God historian, Karen Armstrong says that the book of Leviticus was the nicest book about God ever written up to that time. Because of things like this. God gives fresh starts. Actually, the Bible's full of fresh starts. Once a week, you get a fresh start. Once a year, you get a fresh start. Once every seven years, you get a fresh start. And in case you missed it all, once every 50 years, we're just going to make all things brand new. <clears throat> God does not hold things against people forever. The anger of God never contends with man forever, for he is God and not a man. God's judgments do not last eternally. They lead to redemption and restoration. God disciplines but at the end of the day, he's going to give you a fresh start, even in Leviticus. So I want, to, I, want, I want to talk to you about that. Here's my goal. I have four goals for the morning. One, that you'll be empowered to handle your regrets better. Two, and more importantly, that you'll be empowered to handle other people's regrets better. Everybody believes in a fresh start for themselves. My question is, do you believe in a fresh start for other people? Right? So one, I want you to handle your regrets better. Two, I want you to be empowered to handle other people's regrets better. Three, I want you to fall in love with Jesus again. I'm going to show you where Jesus fits into all of this. And four, I want you to understand the power of celebration. All right? So let's, let's look at this. Um, Leviticus chapter 16. This is the um, record of this day. It says this. This is how Aaron is to enter the sanctuary area with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are the sacred garments. So he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. Let me make one observation about this. This day, if you read further into Leviticus 23, Yom, this day is called Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, you were not allowed to do any work. It's the 
only, it's the only day of the year that the command is Shabbat Shabbaton, absolutely no work. The idea was anyone who makes forgiveness about something you're doing must be cut off from amongst his people. And here's why, here's why. Once you make forgiveness about something you do, then you're gonna have people who do it and you're gonna have people who don't do it. And, and so you're gonna have people in and you're gonna have people out. You're gonna have rank and file and hierarchy and God loves these people more than these people. And that would be a disaster if people ever believed that. So on Yom Kippur, the command was, you're actually not allowed to do anything and anyone who does anything must be cut off from amongst his people. This day was God's gift to man. And when God throws a party, everything has to be right, including the priest underwear. <clears throat> Verse five. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his house. He is then to take two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. So this day centered around two goats. Two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Now, the word scapegoat there is very, very important and it's the one I want you to remember forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So I'm gonna teach it to you and I want you to repeat it with me with some go rock Hampton gusto as if you're trying to make up for my voice deficiency today, okay? Like some, um, I don't wanna work too hard up here, right? right? So, so the word scapegoat there is Azazel, all right? So I want you to try to say that with me with some go rock Hampton gusto. Gusto, go. Azazel. All right, let's try that again because I really want you to remember this past Tuesday. Ready? Go. Azazel. One more time because it's really important. It's going to come back at the end. What was the second goat's name? Azazel. Now, Azazel, the root word Azazel means take him away take him away. Now, the translators can't translate it that way because the translator's job is to make something readable, okay? It's not to be literal. It's to be readable. So if they translate it that way, say, he is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other for the take him away. That doesn't make sense. But the root word, azazel, means take him away. The idea is, is we're going to put something on the head of this goat, and we're going to remove it. This thing's gonna be removed. We're gonna take him away. The other root word, Azazel, means a weapon in the hand of the enemy. A weapon in the hand of the enemy. So the idea is, is that whatever the enemy can use to beat you up, we're gonna take it away from you. We're gonna remove it. And, and, And does the enemy ever need more ammunition than your own mistakes? No. So, so the idea is, is all of your regrets, we're going to put them in a bucket and we're going to remove them. And that's going to, that's going to take away the weapon in the hand of the enemy that the enemy has been using to beat you up. So this day centered around two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for what was the guy's name again? Cause it's really important. Azazel. Now what's also important is you understand the definition. I want everybody to say with some gusto, take him away. Go take him away. All right. So the idea is this day centered around two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for Azazel. Take him away. Now, Aaron <clears throat> shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it away into the desert as the Azazel. Now, um, some quick context. One, the 10 days of all. Um, let me explain that in 10 seconds. Um, we're going to take 10 days from Tishri 1 to Tishri 10. We're going to take 10 days and we're going to fill our bucket up. We're going to become aware of all of our regrets. We're going to be honest about them so that when Yom Kippur happens and it gets emptied, we have a complete empty here. That we're not holding any regrets back. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. Now, something real quick for you Bible nerds. If you're not a Bible nerd, tune me out for 90 seconds. But I'm a bit of a Bible nerd, so let me show you this. The word Kippur itself, Yom Kippur, has four letters. Those four letters have four pictures. Okay, next slide. Check this out. Um, Those four letters have four pictures. Yep. The K, remember that the Hebrew language was originally pictures because they came out of Egypt. So they learned to write in hieroglyphics. All right. The K is a hand over a head. The P is an open mouth, means to speak. And the R is a giant head. So the K is a hand over a head, it means to cover something. The P is to speak. Well, if one P is to speak, what is two P's? 
shout, yell, proclaim, okay? The R is a giant head. It means the head honcho or the highest person. So in the word atonement itself, this is what the comic strip says. If every Hebrew letter is a picture, then every Hebrew word's a comic strip. Here's what the comic strip says. Check this out, next slide. That covering is being spoken loudly out of the mouth of the highest person. Covering is being spoken loudly out of the mouth of the highest person. In other words, hey, on this day, we're going to take all your regrets. And it's not that you didn't do it. And it's not that you shouldn't stop. But what we're going to do is we're going to give you a fresh start. We're going we're to empty the bucket so that you have an opportunity to make next year better. The idea is, is if God gives you a fresh start, the only appropriate response to God's grace is to make a different decision. If you're a school teacher and you have a good student who fails a test, and you know they could do better, and you say, listen, I'm going to give you a do-over on this because I know you're better than this. How would you feel if they turned in the same answers? The, the idea is, is if you are blessed enough to get a fresh start, do something with it. If God gives you a mulligan, hit a better shot. Don't hit it in the water twice. Aim different. Do something. Do something different. This day was about the emptying of all regrets. So this day centered around two goats. One goat for the Lord. And the other goat, what was the guy's name again? Because it's really important. Everybody together? Azazel. Let's try that again. Azazel. And it means take him away. It can also mean a weapon in the hand of the enemy. Now, to fully understand this day, we have to understand that there's three levels to sin. Three levels to sin. To us, sin is sin, not to them. There was three levels to sin. Level number one was called iniquity. Iniquity is the word Avon, like the makeup company. Avon. <laughs> I knew it. <clears throat> I knew it. Even the word for makeup was sin. I knew it. Bye, guy. <clears throat> Avon has three letters, which has three pictures. The first letter is an A, which is an eyeball. Just, they would just draw an eyeball. Second letter is a hook. And the third letter is fish multiplying. So when an ancient Hebrew person read iniquity, what they read was, was whatever your eye hooks to multiplies. Whatever your eye connects to, in other words, whatever gets your attention gets bigger on the inside. If um, my friend has a watch and if my eye hooks to that watch and my need starts to get bigger inside of me for his watch, that's iniquity. Have I done anything? No. Iniquity happens in the heart. Level number two was called sin. Sin is the word kata, kata, which in the pictures say the boundaries that I'm choosing to live in, a different set of boundaries becomes the authority that I must fulfill. In other words, God said this, you're choosing that. Um, one writer put it this way. Sin is when you're drawn away by your own lust and enticed. Let's go back to the watch. When my eye hooks to his watch and it starts to get bigger, that's iniquity. When it gets big enough to create a lust, that's sin. That's sin. Have I done anything yet? No. Iniquity and sin happen in the heart. Level three is called transgression. Transgression. Transgression is the word pesha. Pesha, which simply says this, my own perceptions speak to me as the ultimate reality and consume me. Yeah. In other words, when you believe your own lie, you are really in trouble. Yeah. When you fully believe that your way is better than God's way is going to eat you alive. Let's go back to the watch. Iniquity is when my eye hooks to the watch. Sin is when I lust after the watch. Transgression is when I actually take it. Okay? The Bible speaks to this. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has gone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, God doesn't just forgive you for what you've done. God forgives you all the way back to where your eye hooked to it. This is not just about what you've done. This is about a bucket of regrets in thought and desire and deed. This is complete forgiveness. Now, let me walk you through this ceremony. You can read about the ceremony of Yom Kippur in Leviticus 16, Leviticus 23, Deuteronomy, I want to say 18, and you can also read about it in the Babylonian Talmud. It gives us um, like an order of service. And so uh, let me make an observation about this. The gospel writers say that if everything had been written down about Jesus, the world could not contain the volumes. So when someone says to you, Jesus never did that, really? So you've read all the books the world can't contain? 
what it means is the gospel writers, they picked and chose what they wrote about Jesus to a Jewish audience to try to convince them he was the Messiah. John in particular chooses Yom Kippur as his reference point because it was the holiest day of the year and everybody would have understand what happens on that day. So when you read the gospel, especially John, he uses Yom Kippur as his reference point to show that Jesus was the Messiah. Let me walk you through the ceremony. Now, this ceremony centered around two goats. One goat for the Lord and the other, what was the guy's name? Because it's really important. Together go. Azazel. And it means take him away. All right. So first, the goat for the Lord. The goat for the Lord was taken inside. Inside. Now, here was the problem with that. 300,000 people attended this day. The tabernacle was 15 foot wide by 45 foot long by 15 foot high. You can't, what do you do? So what essentially would happen is there was a goat inside for the Lord. And then the goat outside was meant to show the people outside what the goat inside had accomplished. It's exactly what happened with Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. So the reconciliation of all of creation was made available before the beginning of time. But creation couldn't understand it until it was shown to them on the outside. All right? So you have an inside situation, and then you have an outside situation. The goat for the Lord. The goat would be taken inside, and he'd be tied to the altar. All right? You're supposed to leave your sins on the altar. Then the second part of it was called Mala. Can I hear you say that with me? Because I want you to remember this past Tuesday. Go. Mala. Mala means to lay hands on something. Now, we think of laying hands on somebody as this. Okay? And to them, that is not what laying hands on. Rabbis did not touch sick people because they would become unclean. But did they lay hands on sick people? Yes, but did they touch them? No, but did they lay hands on them? Yes, but did they touch them? No, that is a very hard concept for white Europeans. <laughs> they, they can't get their head around the unliteralness of it. That, to lay hands on somebody in ancient Hebrew had nothing to do with whether you touched them or not. You could lay hands on somebody in today's world over the phone and you're not actually touching them. To lay hands on somebody actually meant to impart what was in your authority to impart over the top of them. Right? So the priest had the authority to impart all the sins of Israel. Everybody bring your bucket. Everybody bring your bucket of regrets. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put it on this goat. So the priest would put it on the goat. Now the Talmud says something interesting. The Talmud says that when the priest put the sins on the goat, that the pressure of it forced the priest to turn his head. So the picture is this. Hang on. The gospel writer John says, That when God the Father placed all the sins of the whole world onto Jesus, what did he have to do? In other words, in other words, the gospel writer saying, hey, 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 is Yom Kippur happening right here in front of us? is, Is this thing happening on a cosmic level? The first step was called mala. Second thing the priest would do after he laid hands on him is he would simply press. He would lay on the goat. He would lay on top of the goat and he would reach around and he would squeeze and the goat would go, ah. I think the idea was, I really, really, really need to make sure the sin is in the goat. Now, there's a play on words here. The Hebrew word for press is Gethsemane. Gethsemane. So, so, so the gospel writer says, and Jesus went to the garden of... It just literally means the place of the press. And, and remember what Jesus prayed? He said, Father, I'm pressed with the sins of the whole world. Once again, it's an imagery to an ancient Jew. Wait a minute. Hey, is Yom Kippur happening right here in front of us? The next part of the ceremony was called, It is Finished. At exactly the ninth hour, the priest would proclaim in a loud voice, It is finished. Why would he say it in a loud voice? Because most people were outside. The proclamation, It is Finished, was for people outside. I'll say that one more time. The proclamation, it is finished, was for those standing outside. Think about that till next week, right? At exactly the ninth hour, the priest would proclaim in a loud voice, it is finished. He would pull the goat's head back, slit its throat. He would then catch 
the goat's blood in a cone-shaped cylinder. It was broad at the top, narrow at the bottom. He would catch it in this cone-shaped cylinder. He would stand up and he would begin to swirl it. Why? Because the blood had to be alive. You couldn't let it congeal. So he would swirl it and he would walk from the altar to the Holy of Holies. And this is what he would say. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I have not yet offered the blood of the sacrifice. Well, hang on. The gospel writer John says, after all these things, he met up with two women in a garden. And what did he say? Don't touch me. Don't. It's, it's, it, wait a minute. Is Yom Kippur happening right here? That the priest would then go in. He would sprinkle blood on the altar seven times. That's a different sermon for a different day. All right. When that was done, he would walk out and he would wash his hands. And after he washed his hands, he could be touched. Wait a minute. John 20, I think. John says, after all these things, Jesus appeared to his disciples in the upper room and he pulled his shirt sleeves up and he offered his hands to be touched. Hang on. Is Yom Kippur happening right here? Right here. So the goat for the Lord. You had Malah, Gethsemane. It is finished. Don't touch me. And then the washing of the hands. After this, you still had a second goat out Side. What was the second goat's name? Because it's really important. What was his name? Azazel. And it means take him away. So after this, you had the goat outside. Here's the record of that. Leviticus 16. It's in the same passage just after some stuff. This is what it says. When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall then bring forward the live goat. There's Azazel. He is to lay hands on the head of the live goat, Mala. He is to lay hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites. All their sins. I went and looked that word up. And in Hebrew, that word is all. <laughs> we tend to like to include our sins while excluding others that have different sins than us. But the word is all. So if you're here today, and when you lay down at night, you're wondering if your sin is the exception. My question to you is this. Does your sin fit into the category of all? But Shane, he's a drug addict. All. But, but you, 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 you say, could God forgive that? You know what? You wouldn't be asking that question if your son was the drug addict. You tend to de-emotionalize yourself when it's not your kid. But, but Shane, he suffers with his, uh, he struggles with um, his sexual orientation. Really? All. Does, does the atonement not include that? Or does it just include your sins? This is something God was getting into his people early on. That you can't want mercy for yourself and then justice for everybody else. If you want God to forgive you of your whole bucket, then you have to be willing to let God forgive them of their whole bucket. <clears throat> all means all. <clears throat> And they're going to put all the sins on the goat's head. So somehow we have to attach all to the goat's head. How do you do that? How do you put everybody's bucket on the head of a goat? We're going to talk about that in a second. And he shall send the goat away. There's that take him away. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed to the task. The goat will carry on itself how many of their sins? All, all of their sins to a solitary place. Oh, by the way, if I haven't made this clear... Um, this is Leviticus. Sounds like God was pretty nice. In Leviticus. <laughs> and the man shall release it into the desert. The man who releases the goat as the Azazel must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterwards, he may come into the camp. So the first is the goat for the Lord. Goat for the Lord was inside. Mala, Gethsemane, it is finished. 
don't touch me, washing of the hands. Now what happens is they bring this live goat. There's 300,000 some odd people out here, and you have one terrified goat, right? He knows what just happened to his mate inside. <laughs> He's not sure what's going on here. And this is what would happen. Step one, mala. We're going to put, hey, everybody bring your bucket. Everybody bring your bucket of regrets. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to place all your regrets on, this, on the head of this animal. Mala. They symbolized it this way. They would take a scarlet woolen thread, a red cord, and they would hold the goat's head and they would wrap the goat's head with red wrapping. And then they would stand the goat in front of the people with red wrapping wrapped around their head. And when the goat stood in front of the people with red wrapping wrapped around his head, it symbolized, hey, all of your regrets are now on my head. Hang on a second. The gospel writers say that during Jesus' trial, Pilate had him stood in front of the Jewish crowd and they wrapped his head with a crown of thorns. Hang on, if you wrap thorns around someone's head and it cuts into the skin, what color does it become? So Jesus is standing in front of a Jewish crowd with red wrapping wrapped around his head. Is Yom Kippur happening right here in front of us? The next part of the ceremony was called the march through the crowd. And they marched him through the crowd. And so the priest would march the goat through the crowd and he would say this, Behold, Israel, your sin is being removed from you as far as the east is from the west. Behold, Israel, your sin is being removed from you as far as the east is from the west. And he would march the goat through the crowd. He would hand the goat to the care of a man appointed to the task. Remember what Jesus said to Pilate? God has given you charge over me by heaven. He would then hand the goat in the care of a man appointed to the task. And he would cut a piece of the red wrapping. So he would cut the red wrapping off of a piece of it off the goat's head. The man would then march the goat into the desert. The priest would come back and he would hang the red wrapping from the temple door. And essentially they would just wait around. I mean, the priest did things like burn fat and did some things. But essentially, you had 300,000 people standing there waiting on the same miracle that happens every Yom Kippur. The Talmud reports that the same miracle happens on Yom Kippur every single year. And here's what would happen. When the goat was released into the desert, what they used to do is they would release the goat into the desert then what they started doing is they started throwing it off a cliff. Here's why. It's just in men to make God harder than he is. That's number one. But number two, there was one Yom Kippur where they released the goat into the desert. And four days later, he returned. <laughs> he found his way home. And so it was like he brought everybody's sin back. <laughs> so we can't have this. So they start throwing them off a cliff, which let me make a point about that. When you bring up someone else's failure, you're bringing their goat back. You are becoming the weapon in the hand of the enemy that God removed. I don't think you want to do that. The church of Jesus Christ should be goat removers, never goat bringers. This made its way into our English language. Did your grandmother ever tell you this? My grandmother told me this. When someone was picking on me and I'd get all agitated, she'd say, Shane, don't let them get your goat. Why? Because the best life is found in a goat-free existence. The church of Jesus Christ, part of its existence is the reminder. Paul said it this way. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. For we have been given this ministry of reconciliation that God is reconciling the whole world through Jesus Christ by choosing not to count men's sins against them. And he has entrusted us with this message of reconciliation. 
The message that the church should be carrying is, is that your sins have been removed. We don't bring your failure back up here. If you want a fresh start, this is the place to have it. White churches love doctrine, so let's make a doctrine out of it, okay? Let's make a doctrine that at this place, this is the place that we remind you your goat has been removed, and we never bring your goat back up because we don't want your failure being brought back up after a year's time. We want you to be reminded that the truth of Jesus Christ is that all of these things have been removed. <clears throat> so, so the goat gets removed and here's what happens. The red cord that he hungs from the temple door, it turns white. It was a miracle, it happened every year on Yom Kippur. The red cord would turn white. The prophet Isaiah talks about this. We, um, he, says, he says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be made white as snow. It's a reference to Yom Kippur. Now I want you to put yourself in, the, in their shoes. You're part of 300,000 people and you've bought your bucket of regrets and you watch the goat leave and then you watch the cord turn white. It was like heaven was saying, hey, let's start over. How do you feel? Well, see, there was a buzz, see. They would start buzzing, but they weren't allowed to do anything yet. But you could feel it, like, like 300,000 people. Because Yom Kippur wasn't over, and they weren't allowed to do anything until Yom Kippur was over. The way Yom Kippur ended was when the cord turned white. There was a chair on the stage. The priest would simply back up to the chair and Yom Kippur ended with one simple move. The priest sat down. <clears throat> and when the priest sat down, it was the indication to the people, there's nothing else left to do. Um, uh, enjoy your do-over. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what would happen then. Um, I'm trying to think of the Hebrew word. Um, they went nuts. <laughs> because when you get a heart revelation that God is not counting your regrets against you and you're getting a fresh start, the only response is to go absolutely crazy. <clears throat> Let me, let me read you, this is from the Talmud. Let me read you one, this was just an eyewitness account of someone who like wrote it down and his own experience and then it survived. Let me read it to you, this is what it says. He then fastened a scarlet woolen thread to the head of the goat for Azazel. And laying his hands upon it again, he recited the following confession of sin for prayer and forgiveness. Oh Lord, I have acted with iniquitous trespasses and sins before you. I, my household, and the sons of Aaron, your holy ones. Oh Lord, forgive the iniquities, transgressions, and sins that I, my household, and Aaron's children, your holy people, committed before you. As this is written in the law of Moses, your servant, for on this day he will forgive you to cleanse you from all your sins before the Lord, and you will be clean. Hang on, hang on. Remember Jesus, remember at his trial, let me test your knowledge of the passion of the Christ, okay? Remember Pilate is in a conundrum? He's, he's like, I don't know what to do with this guy. Pilate's wife is like, don't hurt him, remember? But Pilate doesn't want to riot, so he stands Jesus in front of the Jewish crowd, and he says, you tell me, what do you want to do? And they start chanting something, it's very famous. What do they start chanting? Crucify him, crucify him. Is that all they said? Uh -uh. Watch, look at this, next slide, check this out. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away. Hang on, if a Jewish crowd is chanting, take him away, what are they saying? Azazel, Azazel. Is Yom Kippur happening right in front of us? But it seems to have something far more to do with the whole world than just Israel. Oh, remember? It says that there, um, there has to be a guy put in charge of the Azazel. 
Remember Jesus tells Pilate, um, um, you've been put in charge over me by heaven. And remember in Leviticus it says, after the guy in charge of the Azazels released him, he must wash his hands. Matthew 27, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. Wait, is it, how does Yom Kippur end? Yom Kippur ends when the priest sits. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Hang on, if you have a standing priest, you still have work, right? Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. <clears throat> So wait a minute. So the message of the New Testament is the priest is sitting. So what else is left to do? So what if, so, so what if, um, so is there anything that you've ever told someone they have to do to be forgiven? Well, oh, Jesus, can you just stand up real quick? We've just got these things we need people to do. We do that. We do that. Why? Because we need to satisfy our own conscience somehow. But faith is the part that believes that our priest is sitting. There's nothing else left to do. That's the good. The good news is better than that. The good news is the priest is sitting down. Oh, one last one. Check this out. J John um, is writing about Yom Kippur in one of his letters. I love this insight he gives. This is what he says. First John 2 verse 1. Dear children... I love that, dear children. <laughs> I write this to you so that you will not sin. Hang on. The only appropriate response to God's grace is to live better. If God gives you a do-over, take it and do something different. Don't show up on Yom Kippur every year with the same exact bucket. <laughs> Your life will stink to high heaven. Does God forgive you every time? Yes, where sin abounds, grace abounds, much more. The issue is not forgiveness. The issue is your life. If God gives you a do-over, by all means, do something good with it. Dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But watch the next line. I love this. But if anybody does sin, I love it. Dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if you do, and you will. Watch, watch what he says. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but for the sins of the... Really? So, so it doesn't say this, dear children... I write this to you so that you won't sin. But if, if you do, you can know that Jesus is defending you. How do you know he's defending you? He's defending all born-again Pentecostal believers in Jesus everywhere. <laughs> no. He's defending the sins of the... Why? If Christianity ever got so consumed with God's moral will for their lives that they lose sight of God's redemptive plan for the whole world... It would be horrific. You didn't think God just died for you, did you? We've made salvation so selfish. It's even in our songs. He took the fall and thought of me <laughs> above all. Really? So Jesus is having the worst day ever. 25 billion people have lived and died and he's thinking about you? And not just thinking about you, above all, how do you even sing that song in a group? <laughs> he took the fall and thought of me more than you. <laughs> Do 
Dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if you do, you can know Jesus is defending you. How do you know he's defending you? Because he's defending the whole flipping world and you're just a part of it. Even your cousin Earl. His brother Randy. The wicked ex-wife Joy. And the cook at the local diner Crab Man. Yes! Even them. You might say, but Shane, my son's away from Jesus. I know. I'm really sorry. If I could tell you that Jesus is in a relentless pursuit to get him back And while he's doing that, he's defending him or he would die. Is your son a part of the whole world? Yep. Is he breathing God's air? Yep. Is he held together by God's name? Yep. Is God defending him? Yep. Dear children. (laughs) So how can we remember today? Because I really want you to remember today. They say that great teachers can summarize things in one sentence. I'm not a great teacher, I need four. (laughs) One, the hands have been washed. I don't expect you to remember all of today, so I'm trying to give you something you can hold on to. The hands have been washed. But Shane, I failed, I know. Dear children, (laughs) I wish you wouldn't have. But since you did, you can know Jesus is defending you. And the good news is better than your failure. The good news is that the hands have been washed. Or maybe we can remember it this way. The cord has turned white. The cord has turned white. Wait, but but, but Shane, I keep making the same mistake. I know. Change something. (laughs) Dear children. I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if you do, the good news is better than your failure. The good news is that the cord has turned white. You don't have to live with it one more day. Maybe we can remember it this way. The priest has sat down. Anything in you that wonders if you've done enough to write the scales of the universe so that God will accept you, which is normal. Anything in you. The good news is better than that. The good news is that the priest is sitting. There's nothing else left to do. What are you going to do to improve upon what Jesus did? Really? You, like, you think he's impressed? No. The priest is sitting down. But maybe the best way to remember today is simply this. The goat has left the building. <laughs> Azazelvis has left. <laughs> but Shane, my marriage failed. I know. Dear children. I wish you wouldn't have. I wish you didn't have to go through that. That's horrible. But the good news is better than that. The good news is that the goat has left the building. You, hey, you want a doctrine? Let's give a doctrine. (laughs) From now on, when someone brings up your failure, here's all you have to do. Um, You're right. You're right. I failed. But you know what? I'm actually looking around, and I don't see my goat anywhere. (laughs) But Shane, the marriage failure was my fault. I know. Dear children. The good news is better than that. The good news is that the goat left the building. How long are you going to carry that for? What, it happened eight years ago? Really? Time to let it go. And by the way, if you're the one looking down on the one whose marriage failed, it's time for you to let them be free to have a fresh start. What are you going to do? Hold them there the whole time? How, how, how long? She's 25 years old. What? What? You, what, what? You, 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 but Shane, I got, What? My marriage, I know. You were 34. You're 51 now. (laughs) Might be time to let your goat leave. 
But Shane, it was this crime. I know. Dear children. The good news is better than your crime. The good news is that the goat has left the building. But, but it's this addiction. I know. Dear children. But the good news is better than your addiction. The good news is that the goat has left the building. But Shane, they're wrong about God. I know. Dear children. So are you. you. You honestly think you're right about God? God? They're doing their best. You're doing your best. The good news is that the goat leaves the building for them too. If it leaves the building for you, it leaves the building for them. I need my music, music people. And here's what I want you to do. I bless you today with an awareness that the goat has left the building. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me for a second? Two things. One, if you're here today and you've been walking with Jesus for a while, I want you to take a second and I want you to fill your bucket up. I want you to be honest before the Lord about your regrets. Just between you and God. If you're here today and you've never received what Jesus did for you before the foundation of the world, and you say, you know what, I'd like, I'd like to possess what God has sitting on a table for me. If that's you, why don't you just respond to God right now? You say, what do I say? I say, well, anything you want to say. Anything you want to say. If you need something to say, you can say something like this. Lord Jesus, I have no hope of saving myself. Please forgive me and be the Lord of my life. I'd rather live in your story for my life than my own. I want you to fill your bucket up of regrets. Fill it up. Just fill it up. Fill it up. Now would you look this way? There's a way I could end this. There's certain things that church does very well. We mourn well. We repent well. And there's a way I could say, if you have regrets that have been weighing you down and you want to be released from them, why don't you come up here and we'll play something soft and we'll have a prayer team pray for you. And that has its place. But not today. The way Yom Kippur ended was complete and utter celebration. Now listen to me. I'm taking a risk here telling a room full of largely white people to go nuts. <laughs> white people don't know what you mean by that. They're like, hey. In, in general, when white people dance, they don't even use their feet. They use their shoulders as more. <laughs> when white people dance, it looks like we're trying out for the Special Olympics or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to use something that you're familiar with. Clapping. Um, jumping. I, your culture here is a bit excited anyway. Let me teach you something real quick about clapping. When you clap, it's a, it, there's a way you can clap on beat. And it's like, okay, yeah. But there's a way. Um, clapping in Hebrew culture was agreement. And, and we, we know this intuitively. Like if, if something happens and me and him are excited, I might give him a high five. When hands come together, it's like, Yes. Um, or we make a handshake agreement. Um, and so um, I'm going to invite you. And here's what I'm going to ask. Because this is the altar call. I'm going to ask that no one leave. Because here's what's going to happen. I've seen this happen all over the world. And it's going to happen here. I just know it because I can feel it. If you'll participate in this. You will leave freer and lighter than you've ever been before. There's an anointing going to come into this place that will free you from your regrets through celebration.